Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be going over the 10th passage, which is the last passage in the CP section of the AAMC sample test. Let's get right into it. Oh, I don't like the look of this already. So first, let's read the passage and flow chart what we can. A hospital uses metastable radioactive technetium-99 for the nuclear and geography of a patient's heart after Doppler ultrasound indicates that a lesion constricts the vein leading into the left ventricle. I can't flow chart anything on that yet. The 99TC necessary for the procedure is generated by a molybdenum dash technetium 99 m generator. This passage making me look like a fool. I cannot pronounce these words. In the generator, the radioactive 99MO adheres to an aluminum oxide column placed inside a glass tube. The 99MO decays to 99MTC, releasing a beta particle, beta minus, and an antineutrino U, long U. So I'm getting a little lost. I'm going to flow chart something um, that I noticed. It said that the 99MO decays to the 99MTC and releases a beta minus particle in the process. To extract the 99MTC, a saline solution is passed through the glass tube and over the aluminum oxide column as shown in figure one. The resulting eluate is sodium pertechnitate. Okay, so the the figure, I'm just going to glance at it. I noticed that it's, it's just doing what it was talking about in the passage, and the whole point of it is to get this um, 99MTC out, which is like right here, or right here, whichever way you want to look at it. In order for the pertechnitate to be used as a tag for red blood cells, the hospital combines it with a stannous solution, such as stannous chloride, and reaction 1 occurs. Personally, I'm not going to look at this reaction because uh, it, it's not going to tell me anything right now, and if I need it, I can come back to it. The solution is introduced into a patient prior to a test that involves observing the heart at rest and during exercise on a stationary bike with a load of 30 watts. Always pay attention to units, especially ones that you are familiar with or that you know um, equations for. 99MTC decays to 99TC by emitting 140 kiloelectrovolt gamma photons detected by a suitable camera. The resulting image of blood flow around and through the heart allows an accurate diagnosis of the patient's circulatory system. The radioactivity of 99MTC is shown in figure 2. Immediately when I look at radioactivity and time, I'm thinking half-life, so I'm just going to make a note of that, half-life. My question is, how are they going to relate this back to basic sciences? Because they cannot expect us to know anything about angiography or um, the veins leading to the left ventricle or heart damage or like anything about like the medical part of this. And so we've got to get some basic sciences out of here. Radioactivity could be one that they bring up. Obviously, they could use these watts somehow. They could probably ask us something about this reaction. I see that there's different charges. Maybe there's some redox going on. I don't know. But don't get too caught up in the passage. Stay grounded in your basic sciences. They can't ask you anything too crazy. The first question says, what is the frequency of the emitted gamma photons? Use Planck's constant and the elementary charge. So I know that I'm looking for frequency, which is F. What equations do I know that include F? I know E equals HF, and I also know V equals lambda F. Those are two like super common ones where you will see frequency pop up a lot. I noticed that they give me Planck's constant in the question, but uh, that could be a trap. I don't want to tell y'all that everything's a trap in a question, but sometimes in these little notes, they can give you stuff that's not necessarily important. Now I need to go back up to the passage to see if I can get any more information about these emitted gamma photons. Booyah, I have their charge in kilo electron vo volts. So I know that it's 140 kilo electron volts. I'm going to go ahead and move that over to scientific notation. So that would be 140 times 10 to the 3 electron volts. I know it's pronounced volts. I don't know why I keep saying votes. Electron volts. I could make this even shorter scientific notation and make it 1.4 times 10 to the fifth electron volts. But I'm just going to keep it 140 right now. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. So if I'm going to use this equation, which would make sense because I'm looking for frequency and I have Planck's constant and I think I can get this charge right here, I'm going to need the energy in 
coulombs. And luckily they gave us the elementary charge in the question, uh, but that should also be a value that you guys memorize anyway. So I actually did go ahead and move this 140 to 1 1.4 times 10 to the fifth electron volts, and I'm going to multiply it by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Because if I have this many electron volts and each one is 1 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, then I need to multiply it to see what the total charge is. So I'm actually moving over to this side and multiplying 14 times 16. Don't forget your um, basic math skills you learned in like third grade. They come in handy sometimes. So I got 224. And when you account for the decimals, it's gonna be about you know 2.2 if I round times 10 to the negative 14. So now this is my E. Now I just set up the original equation. Divide both sides by Planck's constant. You should be able to pretty easily see that that's one third, which is going to be 0.33. And then you can take care of your exponents later, which is um, you're dividing them, so you're gonna be subtracting them, so that's gonna end up being to the 20th. Then I will move my decimal over one place to the right, and Lars tells me that I need to subtract one number from the exponent. So now my answer is 3.3 times 10 to the 19th. So the answer of choice there is B. So that was a very mathy one. It might take a while, but luckily this uh, passage was fairly short, so maybe you could uh, get through the passage in two minutes and have an extra minute for uh, this number 52. 53 says, based on the information in figure two, what is the half-life of 99 MTC? So I had a feeling we were going to get a half-life question, mostly because I've done this passage like um, 10 times. But we can see, what is the definition of half-life first off? It is um, how long a radioactive species takes for half of the radioactivity to kind of be dispersed. I think I said that in like the worst way possible. You get my drift. So the radioactivity starts out at 500, so half of that would be 250 right here. We're just going to follow that line over, and then we can see how many hours it takes to get to 250 if we just go down, and it looks like about 6 or 7. Yay. Answer choice A. So see, they throw you a bone after they make you do all that math in 52. 54, the electrically charged particle emitted during the decay of 99MO is... So let's go back up to the passage because um, I kind of forgot what it said about the decay of 99MO. Okay, right here. It says it decays, releasing a beta particle B-. minus. Okay, right there. So we know that it's beta decay, but there's a few different types of beta decay. But right here is our hint that it is beta minus decay. In which case, it's a basic science to know that the particle released in beta minus decay is an electron. 55, the advantage of Doppler ultrasound technique over the standard ultrasound technique is that it allows. So whenever you see Doppler um, on the MCAT, I want you to think movement. The Doppler effect um, has to do with um, sound waves kind of stretching out or being compressed due to movement of whatever is emitting the sound. And it doesn't just have to be sound waves. It can be light waves too. But most of the time you're talking about sound waves. And the MCAT loves talking about Doppler ultrasounds um, as a medical application of the Doppler effect. So let's see if we can find something about movement. A, distinguishing between fluids and tissue. That doesn't have anything to do with movement. B, measuring the blood flow. I love that because blood flowing, movement, flow, Doppler, yada, yada, it all goes together. C, measuring the tissue density, and D, measuring the heart wall thickness. Um, neither of those have to do with movement. And so, I, I mean, stick to this. Like, it will never let you down if you just associate Doppler with some kind of movement. Oftentimes, it's talking about blood flow. Like, they do Doppler ultrasounds to look for blood clots because there will be a disturbance in the blood flow in the veins if, um, if you have a blood clot. So just always think about blood flow or movement, something like that. 56, what is the work done by the patient during a three-minute exercise on the bicycle? So I knew this other unit was going to come in handy. We know that the load of the bicycle is 30 watts, which is a unit of power. And I know if you're like me, when you see work, you tend to think of work equals force times distance, which is, that's totally fine to, for that to be your instinct. But when we're given a measure of power, we should be able to see that the power equation is going to come in handy here. So it's power equals work over time. We know our power is gonna be 30 watts. We're looking for work, 
and we know our time, it's not three, it's actually the unit of the time is in seconds, and so it's going to be 180 seconds. So multiply both sides by 180, and you get that the work is equal to whatever 180 times 30 is. If you can't do that math quickly in your head, you should at least know that it's going to be a large number, but it is 5,400 joules. So that was the end of our entire CP section. It went by so fast and easily. I hope that was helpful. Stay tuned for other sample test breakdowns and let us know what else you want to see in the comments. Peace.